This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary actress whose many unforgettable performances spanning over six decades on the stage, in the movies, and on TV have brought her worldwide acclaim. She won a Theatre World Award in 1962 for her Broadway debut in Everybody Loves Opal. She then received three Tony Award nominations for her performances on Broadway in Cactus Flower, How Now, Dow Jones, and The Goodbye People. She received a Golden Globe Award nomination in 1970 for Most Promising Female Newcomer for her very first movie role in Where It's At. For her performance in Midnight Cowboy, she received Best Supporting Actress nominations for a Golden Globe Award and a Laurel Award. And a few years later, she received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress, and she won a Golden Globe Award for her brilliant portrayal of Linda in Once Is Not Enough. She earned a Saturn Award nomination for her work in Capricorn One, and she's co-starred in many other great movies, including I Love My Wife, Going Home, The House by the Lake, Airport 77, The First Deadly Sin, Love Affair, The Mirror Has Two Faces, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and one of my all-time favorite romantic comedies, Boynton Beach Club. For her work on television, she won an Emmy Award for Best Supporting Actress in The Shape of Things, and she received three more Emmy Award nominations for her work in Sarah, The Golden Girls, and the highly acclaimed miniseries You Don't Know Jack, for which she also won a Satellite Award for Best Supporting Actress and a nomination for an Online Film and Television Association Award. Her television credits also include Judgment, The Trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Guiana Tragedy, The Story of Jim Jones, A Long Way Home, Paper Dolls, Gypsy, and many more shows. And of course, she's renowned for her voice work in The Smurfs, The Critic, and Johnny Bravo. In 1992, our guest was named the Queen of Brooklyn at the Welcome Back to Brooklyn Festival. And in 2001, she received an Outstanding Achievement Award from the Los Angeles Italian Film Association. I am delighted and deeply honored to welcome the one and only Brenda Vaccaro to our show. Brenda, thank you so much for being here. In a nap. That's the longest line of things. I don't even remember half of them. But I mean, uh, thank you for saying all of them. I don't know what to say to that, except I found myself going to sleep. Anyway, here I am. Nobody could ever go to sleep when they think of Brenda Vaccaro. If you've forgotten those roles, it can't be because you didn't enjoy doing them. Oh, no, I I loved every bit of work that I was doing. Thank you, Lou Wasserman. Because he ran, as you know, he ran Universal. So he kept me working all the time. My God, I never got a break. But yes, thank you. What can what more can I say? I mean, it's the longest list I've ever heard. And I only <laughs> just touched the surface. I want to take you back to May 29th, 1970, when you appeared on the cover of Life magazine. What went um, through your mind when you saw that? My mother's going to love this. That's what went through my mind. And they put it up in general in the train station. And my mother flew in from Dallas, Texas, to see it in a huge photograph. Remember, they used to do the photograph up there of the cover of Life magazine. And she went, oh, oh, she was so, her breath was just taken away from her. It was so sweet. She was so proud. Was there a moment that you can recall now when you knew you were going to be a success as an actress? No. Never. Never? Not even with all those Broadway roles and those nominations? I think I think I got more curious and more ambitious as time went on. But I certainly just had fun at the beginning. I was so happy. And I loved who I was working with. I adored Eileen Eckert. I just worked with the best. I worked with the best. You know, and that was the greatest group of actresses, Kim Stanley, Geraldine Page. I mean, they were just 
they took your breath away. You just wanted to be as good as they were. Please, God, let me be, you know. So were there some role models or mentors in the industry that you looked up to and, and, and who helped? Maureen Stapleton and Kim Stanley. I adored both of them, and they were both my friends. I had a lim- I had was taking them home in a limo one night, <laughs> and they used to call me that Hollywood actress, and they were fighting. It was just hysterical. I couldn't believe it. And when we got to Maureen Stapleton's house, Kim was getting out, and Maureen turned around and said, "Are you coming with me?" And Kim said, "Yes." And I went, "I'm getting out of here." <laughs> I think they stayed up all night drinking. So I was glad, I was glad I got out. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be part of that. In 1971, you co-starred with Michael Douglas in a movie called Summer Tree, produced yes. by Kirk Douglas and directed by Anthony Newley. What was yes. he like as a director? Nervous. He was very nervous. And he slept a lot in the car that brought him to and from. Was, I think he was overwhelmed. But he was charming and he was very sweet and supportive. I remember him as being really a very nice gentleman. I don't know what kind of a director he was, but he was a very nice gentleman. And I think he wanted Michael's part. So he sort of tended to care about himself more as an actor than a director. He was funny, too. He had a great sense of humor. Do you have a a favorite director that you've worked with over the years? I've worked with so many. I really was interested in every single director I worked with because they were all famous. Do you know what it means? So it would be like, "Mm, what am I going to think about this guy? I think Barry Levinson was just the the joy of my life. I really loved him. He was great to work with. He didn't say very much, but I liked that. Did you ever consider directing yourself? Did you ever want to? No. Not interested at all. And what would you consider to be the qualities of the kind of director that would bring out the best performance for you? Mostly silence. Really? You don't want them to? Mostly observation. And I think I did this amazing scene with Al Pacino once. And it was something we just decided to do together. And it was to improv the scene where he knows that his sister has revealed through the daughter of the sister about him. And it put him in jail, actually. It was, but it's in a, it's in a, we were in Minnesota and we were in the kind of restaurant that they were in, which was a big, whatever that big hamburger joint is. Oh, you're talking about you don't know Jack. Yeah, I am. That's right. Thank you. And we improvised the whole scene. And we never told Barry this is what we were going to do. We just flowed and glowed right through it. And at the end, we both heard print. So he wasn't even going to cover it. He loved it. And that's the kind of director he was. He was just classy, very smart. He knew when the work was as good as it was going to get. And he would print it. He'd say, print. We did argue with that. Why don't you try to do this now? Or change that a little bit. Or couldn't hear you on that. Whatever it was, he said very little. He watched a lot. And I remember when I did my audition for him on film. I'll have you know it was on film. And afterwards, he said, you're great on film. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you, Barry. You know, he said, I'll see you again. I hope. I said, me too. I didn't even know. (laughs) But that's when Annie hired me the next day. So do you ever watch your performances on film? Yes. Yeah, I did. I would watch them. Are you happy when you see your performances? Uh, Sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on what I might have missed. You know, nothing's perfect. So, and I wasn't looking to be perfect, but I was a student of my work. 
So I would mm, pay heavy attention to how the scene worked or what I thought of the work. Now I think you have to. It's the only way to get better. In 1974, you played Ethel Rosenberg in an excellent TV movie called Judgment, The Trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. How do you prepare for a role when you're playing a real person? Hair, makeup, Stanley Kramer coming in and saying, not good enough yet, makeup people wilting, hair people wilting, you know, doing it again, coming up with the way that it was supposed to look. And there were pictures all over of Ethel Rosenberg. And Stanley was really also an extraordinary director who loved your work, loved your commitment, loved your contribution. He was a positive. He'd say, I love the scene. I just think mm, mm. it's very short, you know, not a lot of talk. Because a lot of talk is when you're working, it's sort of boring. It's, it can be invasive. You know, because you're really concentrating. So, and I loved working with him. He was well, great. We had his daughter on the show, Catherine Kramer, and she said that he loved you. Did she say that? Yeah. Huh. yeah. Well, that makes my heart jump because I loved him. He I was think the great. thing about you in Hollywood and on the stage in New York is that people like you. They, You're easy to work with. You're fun. You don't have an ego. You don't take yourself too seriously. And you have a sense of humor. That makes a big difference because you're a team player. That was my mother's advice. <laughs> Everything you just said. Oh, my God. That was mom. You know, be quiet. Be, do your work. You know what I mean? She was a really good mother. She was really good. She when never I, said too much, but just enough. I have to so, tell you something so funny. She wanted to be an actress when she was young. And I have her voice. And so... She went into an audition with a ukulele. This would have to have been 1927, something when she was very young. And she was a guy in a pit with a cigar, which with a piano. I mean, if you can imagine this, it's like out of a movie itself. She goes on with her ukulele and she starts singing the song everybody was thinking. He said, we're not hiring baritones today. <laughs> and crossed her forever. She never went back. Meanwhile, my voice got me work. You know, I said, Ma, you should be happy. It paid off. And she went, mm. <laughs> Your voice was really an asset, especially in comedies. Oh, thank you. Good. But I love it, working with B. Arthur. That was just, that was the epitome. Of oh, joy. we're going to talk about that. I can't wait. But first, I got to ask you, in 1980. Yes. You did something no other actress had ever done. You what? did a commercial for tampons. Now, how did that come across? I had a manager named Marty Bregman, and he said, are you crazy? You're going to do this. They're paying you a fortune. I said, I, 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 I don't know if I can. He said, make a joke about it. So Gail Parent and I sat down. She's a wonderful comic writer. She's a genius. And she said, you know, end it with... I thought it was a bra. <laughs> Is that what you did? That was the greatest line known to man to say that at the end of the commercial after they gave me all this nonsense, you know, double, double absorbent, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of it, just say, I thought it was a bra, which was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, of course, they all did somersaults. They thought, what? What is that? You know, I was hoping they would be smart enough because today they would probably put that kind of a commercial on. In those days, it was like four guys that looked like ex-Marines sitting there going, what did she just say? What did she just say? <laughs> it was like impossible to believe that I threw in the bra, you know, but anyway, I love doing it. They, of course, did not use it, but it was an interesting, it was a real interesting experience. Well, you I know, you people. took a lot of heat for doing that commercial. There was even a spoof by Andrea Martin on SCTV. Did you see it? And R Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers did it to me, too. Yes, I did. I loved it, though. I thought she was fabulous, especially <gasps> the breaths that she took. She was so funny. I love her. She's brilliant. Did you get to work with Joan Rivers? Oh, yes. Oh, good God. In a musical that Lee Grant 
was and the producer George George Not Slaughter. Him. Yeah, we did a show with him as the producer, Lee Lee Grant as the director. Lynn Redgrave, my heart, my heart. I loved her so much. She was so wonderful. And Joan was in it. So there were just, Phyllis Diller was in it. I mean, there were just so many great people that were in it. And it was all women. It was all about women. So, yes, I had a very good time talking about Miss Joan Rivers, who was hysterical. Friend of a Carl Brent. Sounds like an African river. You know, she'd do things <laughs> Is that what she said? <laughs> well, you know, I got to ask you about B. Arthur. You had oh. an iconic Emmy-nominated performance in The Golden Girls. You were Angela Petrillo, who was married to Dorothy's oh. brother and Sophia's son, Phil, who had just passed away. That was a very emotional episode revolving around the fact that Phil was a transvestite. Can you share some memories of working on that show? I loved B more than words could ever reflect. All of them were great and very gracious and very professional. The funny thing was every time we were off stage, backstage, one of them would say, you know, B thinks she's the big star, but I have something to tell you. I mean, they all would give me gossip about what all of them thought about B. B was the main star, you know, B was everything. I mean, every one of them, Rue McCallaghan, they were all wonderful. I was mesmerized by their talent. And the, the communion of all of them together was just so special. Oh, my God. And Would the you... writing, Gail Parent was one of the writers. Yeah. So, and she insisted I do the show. And I went to do the show with like, oh, oh, wow. You know, I was so proud of myself that I got that show. Would you I have loved, liked to do a show like that? I mean, I think you would be a perfect person. I think for, they should do it again. Would I, you do it? I have to tell you, honey, I have to tell you a funny story. B. Arthur and I got along really well. I mean, she she would call me. One time she called me and she said, Brenda, it's B. Don't call me back. Anyway, she said, I saw you last night on this wonderful show, and she mentions the name of the show, she said, don't call me back. And she kept doing it after she'd say, and there you were, don't call me back. There you were, she just did, don't call me back, so many funny times. I was dying, I was laughing so hard. And of course, I didn't call her back. You never did? <laughs> I knew she meant it. But anyway, she was divine. When she died, I really was so sad. I lost a great friend and a genius comedian. I mean, look how, ah, oh, how perfect she was in her timing. You know, I learned a lot from her. And Rue McCallaghan, it was, they were all adorable. It was magic. I, I was in a magic state then. I really was lucky. So let me ask you then, if they were to turn Boynton Beach Club into a sitcom, would you be in for it? I'd go to Europe. I'd go to Paris. You wouldn't do it? I don't think so. You know, here's something interesting, I guess. I don't know. But once you do something, that's the work there. That's it. I, I can't go back. I don't remember. Not only, but I don't, don't care. And it's not the same, mm, you know, it's not, uh, it's not the same energy. So to go back, it's, it's difficult for me. I don't believe in it. You know, I go forward. Give me something new to think about. Something that I might fail in because I'm not good enough. Let me fight to be good enough. You know, it's like uh, I'm a different person. I'm a different actress now. Do you like to pick and what? choose your parts now? Are you picky about what you will do now? Sort of. But I'm very happy to go to work. I just did something called the Nonas. You remember that story? about the Italian mother, grandmother, and her son-in-law, no, her grandson, thank you, uh, decides that she doesn't have to stop working. She can go into a little restaurant and make her lasagna, her meatballs, her sausage and peppers, and he's going to find a little place for her on Staten Island, and she can have her girlfriends come, and they can also, you know, cook, and we'll make a restaurant. And it's called the Nonas. It's really was so much fun. 
There was Susan Sarandon. There was Lorraine Bracco, Talia Shire, and me. And Vince Vaughn played, the, and, and he was one of the producers. So I've never had so much fun in my life. All we did was laugh. It was, I miss them all. But would I go back and do it again? I don't think so. No. What about when you were in Friends? You played Joey's mother, Gloria Tribbiani. Did you have fun on that set? Yes. You know why I had fun? It was the sixth show. Nobody knew they were going to be a star. Nobody knew the show was going to be a success. These kids were so adorable and innocent and well-meaning and working so hard. What do you think of the show? I said, I think it's wonderful. I love it. That's why I'm here. They were all like on tippy toe about it, you know, working so hard and being so intense and in rehearsal, you know, going like this to me. They were just loving and uh, I had the best time with all of them. I love them all. Jesus. Oh, God. They were and, so good. And and what about The Mirror Has Two Faces? You played Barbara Streisand's best friend. What was she like to work with? She's my best friend. So it was kind of magical. She never said anything. She just let me do what I wanted to do. And and that's because she knows me so well. And I I loved it. I had a very good time. I usually have a very good time. I believe, you know, that spirit is is half the battle of carrying on. And so I think I have my mother's spirit, which is always keep a gil and in your belly and a smile on your face and do your work and love it and be, be fortunate. Did you get and to no, know Lauren Bacall while you were making The Mirror Has Two Faces? Whoa, you picked the toughie, huh? <laughs> oh, I had to ask. We had, a, we had a terrible argument, terrible. But anyway, Betty was great. She was a stalwart. She was a tough cookie, but I respected her. I had a lot of respect for her. She was she was good to work with. I must say that. We had you our know, bouts. You know, you've been in the industry so many years, and yet I don't sense that toughness in you. You're, you're still full of life. You're still very optimistic. You really have fun. You're not tough yeah. and hard like so many other people that have been around so long. Really? Do you find a lot of tough people? Well, that that's that comes from depression or disappointment. I think tough. So, did it? Haven't you found that there were a lot of people like Lauren Bacall that were really pretty tough and jaded and cynical in the business? No, she wasn't cynical, and she wasn't jaded. She was very frightened. She cared so so much about being good. No, that wasn't her. She was just feisty. Do you know what I mean? She was feisty. We didn't get along at the beginning because she kept wanting to squish me, you know? And she would send messages to the stage manager. And one night I just got sick of it. And I knock on her door downstairs. I had to come down the stairs. My dressing room was upstairs and I knocked on her door. And Vivian Lee walked out drunk. And I went, like, whoa, that was one of my favorite actresses of all time. I mean, nothing could ever match her. Vivian was incredible. Anyway, she was leaving. And I walked. She had been visiting Betty. It was after the show was over. And I went in. And she started telling me about, all you're doing is going, ah, uh, uh. I said, listen to me. I said, some people can tell me what to do on stage. And some people can't. You're one of the ones who can't. And I walked out. We didn't talk for a month. But I had to tell her to stop. She was so she was wrong. You don't do that. You're not negative like that. You know, it was competitive and negative and it just didn't feel good. So I had to do I it came out of me organically. Just a natural thing to do is to protect myself. Did that happen often to you? No. No, actually, it didn't. Thank and if it God. did, I would stand up for myself. I don't remember. I remember her because it was a big moment. And Vivian Lee, 
who was leaving. I had just been mesmerized by the presence of her. I felt like saying, oh, my God. You know, I wanted to tell her what I thought of her as an actress. She was brilliant. Did you tell her? No, I didn't have a chance. She was a bit tipsy. What a shame. What a shame. I know. She left kind of like, she looked at me and, and she was like, what is that wonderful play she was in about Tennessee Williams' play? The, oh, you remember? we're talking about and Streetcar Named was in it. Streetcar Named Desire. Yes. And I just never forgot her performance in that. I thought she was mesmerizingly brilliant. Unbelievable. And it wasn't one second that she wasn't brilliant. So, Brenda, you were part of the cast of an excellent Netflix series called Gypsy, starring Naomi Watts. You played Claire Rogers, a neurotic mother who was totally obsessed about her daughter's life choices. Were you surprised when the series was canceled after only one season? Not really. I think Naomi was not happy in it. She never said that to me, but she was always so quiet when she had to do her lines. And she had to talk as an analyst. It was just very quiet. And I think she just wasn't unhappy. She was unhappy with being in this project. And she didn't discover it until she had to do it. And I don't think she wanted to go on. Uh, and I knew quite well that because actress to actress, I could tell. As a matter of fact, the last day that we worked together, I couldn't hear her almost. And I said, after... She finished. I said, what did you say? Because it was the last day we were going to be on, on film together. And she looked at me like, and I said, no, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear it. I just put those lines in. I had to. You know, she was hiding. And But it's understandable. But I, I think it was because she, th listen, there are times where you take a project and you do it full out. And everybody goes, it's, it's not going to work. You know, we've done everything we can. We have excellent cast. Not going to happen. So sometimes you don't know until you do it. You know what I mean? But you must get disappointed fairly often throughout your career when these things don't take off and you're sure that they would. Yeah, sort of. But, you know, there's always something else to do. And I'm always looking forward to a new beginning. I'm always looking forward to working. And it's so important for me to go on rather than to think, oh, I wish, you know, well, I wish that had been, you know, I'm just too busy moving on. And that's what it's all about, too. You know, I don't want to be in the same thing. That's the only thing about the theater that made me nervous was you could be in the play for two years. Hello. <laughs> I don't know that I could do that. You know what I mean? I, I like to move on. Yeah, Barbara Streisand said in her book that doing Funny Girl that long was really hard to keep stimulated, to keep the performance fresh. But you did it in so many ways. I think that's very true. I do. I think sometimes you get better at your performance. It gets richer. It gets more flowing and glowing. Do you know what I mean? It, there's things you learn as you do it. Your audience teaches you so much, you know, especially a musical. Wow. When I did How Now, Joe Jones, I was learning all, all, all the time, all the time. And, you know, the interesting thing was that I'd never done a musical before. So I did. And I didn't know what the fourth wall was. And after I sang it one night, I got it. And. It was like I was in a home run. And afterwards, the audience started applauding and they didn't stop. And I was like, and the gentleman I was doing it with was also, and the guy that was conducting, everybody was like, what happened? You know, and the audience went crazy. And I didn't realize that you don't thank the audience. And I just very quietly lift, let my head go down because it didn't stop. And I went, thank you. Thank you. Well, if you could have heard the steps of George Abbott coming down 
that hallway to my room, banging the door open and saying, do you know what you did? You broke the fourth wall. Don't you ever, ever do that again. And I was like, I had no idea what he was talking about. I just didn't know. What a lesson. What a lesson he gave me. I won't go into what he said more. But deep down, aren't you glad you did it? Deep down. Oh, well, yes. I mean, that's what you do anyway. You just keep, you give the, the audience. I was talking to somebody who really knew a lot, Eileen Eckert. She said, you give the audience time to applaud you courteously. And then you say your next line to Hiram. It was Hiram Sherman. You say your next line to him and you keep moving. And they know to stop. You don't say thank you. Okay, guys, you can stop now. <laughs> but Brenda, I get the feeling that you <laughs> loved being on the stage as much as you love being in front of the camera. You like both just as much. I love them. It's a state of giving. And so when you're in a state of giving, nothing, giving, no matter what it is, I don't care if you cook a meal and you give it to your friends. You know, the state of giving is joyful. And it's the right thing to do, especially if you know you have talent. If you don't have talent, it's really hard on those to accept what you think <laughs> is such a great meal. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I love what I do. Well, it really shows, I'll tell you. I really loved Boynton Beach Club. I loved your friendship with Diane Cannon. I thought that yes. was very poignant. You know, you were... We still have it. She came here to the Paley Center with her daughter to advertise Archie. And I showed up. Damn right, I showed up. And she saw me coming, walking towards her. And she went, oh, I knew you were going to come. I said, of course. And I went up on stage with her and told her how fabulous I thought she was. You know, and how fabulous I thought as a producer, what she did was phenomenal. Have you seen it? I saw the miniseries. I thought that it was incredibly well done because we really got to, to know who Cary Grant really was and yes. what that marriage was all about. That's right. You know, and because he's such an enigma. Yes. And he was a clever hider. <laughs> what do you think he was hiding from? Did you know him? I did very briefly, very briefly. I went to Peter Stone's house and he drove me home. And then I saw him once for dinner. And when I was in Monaco once, he was there. And I think Grace Kelly was still alive. And I, I went with John Davidson to do some presentation. I don't know. I was all excited, but he was there. And I heard him say, which is Brenda Vaccaro's trailer? You know, and I was in the trailer and I... I I loved him. I thought he was a great talent. I thought he was, God, he was great in one movie. That he, Well, he was great in all of them. But the one he did with the English actress, oh, I can't remember now. The, you know, there's so many movies, my God. But anyway, I, I honored him. Yeah, I thought he was amazing. I'm fascinated that you felt he was hiding. Well, no. All right. Let me take back the word hiding. That's because you and I know something. It was more of a privacy. It, but that's English, too. Do you know what I mean? That sense of privacy. They know how to do that in terms of a very natural way. Yeah, but I do. think that there are some of your colleagues who really lost the sense of who they are, their own identity. You've never lost who you are. You're still Brenda you still really connect with the lessons your mother taught you. You know, you've played all these roles, but you never had to invent yourself off camera. And some of your colleagues have really never developed a sense of who it is that they are because they never resolved issues that were difficult for them when they were young. And that's how I felt about Cary Grant, that he, he could never really show who he really was. Whereas you... I don't think he wanted to... I think it was a very private, a very, he was a very private gentleman and a gentleman he was. And I think he was very wise about what he wanted to expose and what he didn't. And he had a sense of respect for himself and his private life. And it didn't have anything to do with what he gave the audience. He gave the audience everything. You remember the movie he did with Deborah Carr? And at the, when he walks in and he realizes 
she's the one that is the cripple. She's the one that got hit by the bus. Remember? Yeah. I mean, that moves me even now to say it to his face when he was aware it was her. All of a sudden, the whole movie changed. It was like, oh, my God, you know, I think he was English. He respected it. And there's nothing you can do. Glenda Jackson was the same way. Ask her about something emotional, she'd say, no, rather not. <laughs> so they don't want to talk about it. It's, it's not something they want to share necessarily, which I about- respect because it shows an American actors to American actors do so much. They cry when they should leave it for you to cry. The audience, to, you know what I'm saying? Am I going on a bit much? But anyway. No, I, you know I, I get mean. what you're saying. I just wonder whether you, you seem to have dealt with being famous, being popular, being a star very easily. You you don't strike me as, you know, worried about your image or worried about how you're going to no. come across. You just seem to be you. And I find that so refreshing. You don't worry. And you know what? I think that word star is overused. I mean, I, I don't think... I'd rather not think I'm a star. I'd rather have people waiting for me outside of Gallagher's in New York City. And they have 14 pictures of me. And I go, what's all this? Well, we knew you'd show up one day. And I go, well, this is the day. But I ain't got time. for six days. You know, and I go, that's amazing. You know, I mean, like, what's in it for them, really? I guess whatever, either autograph people. But that, you know what that tells me then? I I don't think you really realize how popular and beloved you really are. But let me tell you something. Coming to New York, and I've been here for five years, and Hemingway said people are places. And it's a great phrase, as tiny as it is. I'm telling you, it has become apparent to me that all New Yorkers that I've met or that have stopped me on the street have seen my work. And they go, you're so good. And I go, oh, thanks. And I think, well, I wonder what they saw, you know. And Well, don't you don't see know. it? I just think that word star is like a 1930s line. It's, it's like a 1930s label. Hey, you're a star. You know, Audrey Hepburn star. You know, I'm just an actress and I'm good and I love my work and I intend to work till the day I die. I hope I sit up in bed and do some kind of a scene before I go, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't think you really have a sense of how you come across on screen that people feel they know you when you, you know, when you. Maybe there's too much of me in it then. I don't know. That's not so good when you have to be playing someone who limps. You know, something's wrong with them. They had a they had a stroke. You can't go, oh, she's still herself. No, but oh, I think I, they feel they like feel being Mary. You can't say there's Brenda Vaccaro. You know, you gotta see Queen Mary. Remember Glenda Jackson, how brilliant she was? Oh my God. She gave herself up. To every part she did, there was no Glenda. There was the character. But you yeah. look at yourself in you don't well, know Jack. Personality actress is what you're telling me. Well, when thinking. you look at your performance with Al Pacino in you don't know Jack, you play his sister. It's a very strong you're personality. So you have a no. You have a lovely way of moving on to the next. Well, because my point is that when you yes. play a role like that, you're playing somebody we can identify with. That we've all known someone just like that. That's why we feel we know you. What was the movie? You Don't Know Jack. That was the one with Al Pacino. Oh, yes. That's when I was his sister. Yeah. And that's a very... Armenian sister. Yeah. And there's a scene when you're driving a car and he's beside you. And we all know someone who behaves like that in our lives. We all know somebody. And I think it's not that we're saying, oh, that's Brenda Vaccaro. I think we're saying... She has this way of tapping into a kind of behavior, a tone of voice, a certain delivery that resonates with people. And that's why they come up to you and they say, oh, you're so good. It's because you deliver a performance that we remember. It's memorable. And I don't think you get that. a big party, Harvey. 
I sound like I'd be a better party hostess. You know, have you ever been to one of her parties? Yeah, isn't she great? I want people to believe the characters I do, but I understand what you're saying. And it's very kind of you. And it is a compliment. And I do accept it. It's just that I'm very demanding from myself. You know, if I have to play an Armenian sister who washes her brother's clothes and took care of him without letting anybody know he was a kooky bird, you know, <laughs> it's it's terribly important to accomplish that. And that's why when Al said he said it at 8 a.m. and he was behind the camera and so was I. And he said, we're off the book, right? And I went, uh, it meant no script. And I said, yeah, okay. And that was all improvised. And that scene was brilliant. I mean, that's when I told you Barry Levinson said print it. That's all we heard from him. Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody ever said anything like, God, that was great. It was just so important for us to do that somehow. And the writer wasn't really tuned in because it wasn't, his scene was not really on target. Do you know what I mean? So we had to do something that was like, I betrayed my brother. My daughter betrayed my brother. Do you see what I mean? We had to make it powerful. And I'll never forget Al Pacino for that. I loved him for it. I've known him. So many years, we were both with Marty Bregman, the manager, and the financial disaster person. But anyway, that's when I met him. We were both kids. We were like 18 or 19. or Do you know what I mean? It was like, so for Al and I to do that was uh, totally magic, total magic. But that scene was not written. That scene was one, two, one. It was like improv, perfect improv. If Lee Strasberg had seen it, he would have given us a medal. It doesn't happen very often, I can no. imagine. Never would you be allowed to do that, especially in a television production. Well, we got to thank Al for that because he said we're off the book, right? And I went, I said, I'm in thought, huh? You know, and then I just said, okay, yeah. Because I thought it was going to be fun. I thought it was going to be fun. So it's Brenda, hard for me to look where I'm supposed to look because you're so engaging. I'm like right here <laughs> looking at you. That's well, believe me, I'm pretty engaged in you right now. Tell me, are you ever going to sit down and write a memoir? Oh, God, everybody says that to me. Well, look at all these I'm stories. I'm a good talker. I'm not a good writer. So Do you dictate. Know what I, mean? I love talking. My father used to say, "Have you ever looked up five words in a dictionary in your life?" to see what they mean. No, Dad, try it. <laughs> but you know, if you don't write down those stories or dictate them into a machine and let somebody else type them, they're going to be lost forever. That might be it. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the way to you do You know it. what I think the big worry is that you don't really sit there and contemplate the past a whole lot. You're not thinking about all these roles you've done. You're too interested oh. in what's going on in the present. And you can see how much I forget. <laughs> the you, name of that movie. you don't I mean, sit there. I mean, there's so much and... work. Uh, what about Sarah? You haven't even come up with Sarah at Universal, that woman that went west at, at a time where women were not accepted anywhere in the East to have a job or be independent or cut their hair off. Or, you know, that was, I had Ann Roth as a costume designer, and Lou Wasserman sent word, did I mind? If he took 20000 a week off my salary to pay her. What did you say? I said, no, absolutely not. And I said, by the time, the, tell Lou, by the time this series is over, the one thing he will be remembering is the costumes. They were brilliant. They absolutely. were brilliant. I had, you, I had a picture now I'd show you one that was like no, a velvet the, jacket. It, I it mean, just... I, I remember you know, this series. I, I was surprised to see you in a Western. It wasn't uh, what we thought you would do. And I, I was surprised that the series didn't keep going. You must have been disappointed. Yeah. Well, there were other reasons for that. There were other reasons for that. I think I was tired. I don't think I realized the kind of work that was going to be in front of me every day, every day, every day. You know, and I just think at the time, 
I wanted to move on. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want, I did 12. And after that, I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to be this kind of actress. I want to do other roles. I want to do other parts. I want to move into another kind of creative work. I don't want to do this because then it would maybe be another 12. And then, an, you know, you could get caught up in that hole. Well, look at your friend B. Arthur. She did Maud for all those years. And then she did Golden Girls for what, six years, seven? Yeah, I don't know. But let me tell you something. That was the only thing she could do, really, that she would stand out as a brilliant comedian the way she did in Golden Girls. Who's going to write as good as they did on Golden Girls for B? Even when she said, Mom, you know, it was like, it was so perfect. She was, she was a genius. So, I mean, for her to stay there, she was the queen. She ruled that stage. But don't you think there's a role that could be created for a TV series for you that would intrigue you enough to keep you doing it for a couple of years? I don't know. We're supposed to be talking about what I did do. If you're asking me what I want to do, I don't know. Well, what do you want to do? Is there anything you haven't done that you want to do? Yeah, find just the right guy. Oh, boy, he would have to be... He would have to tick off every box. I would like to find just at this time in my life, just the right friend, you know? I will be there in an hour. What the hell did I do? I will be there in an hour. (laughs) I'll have you, Harvey. So far, this meeting is going terrific. I'm having such a good time. You think you can put it on the air? We absolutely put it on the air. I just, oh I think, oh my God, I find you so refreshing and so unfiltered and you're loving your life so much. And I, I, I hope you do meet the right guy because you deserve it. You're fun. Thank you. Thank you. I packed six suitcases and left my house in California. I got meet and greet from Delta. You know what that is. They come and pick you up. They lift your ass right up, put it in the car. You take your suitcases, right? You know, you get to the airport, they pick you up, put you in, <laughs> we're in your seat. Your suitcases are gone, all six. Yes, ma'am. You know, and I came back to an apartment I had rented to do gypsy. And I got permission to come back. They said, yes, if you give the board this. And here's how much it's costing you. And I said, fine. I'd done gypsy. I had money in the bank. I was ready to go. I got here. I was so happy. Because the scotch tape I'd had four months before I left was still on the table. And I said, I belong back in New York. You don't miss California? What about all your friends in California, like Barbara? I left him. (laughs) So don't ask me anymore. But it it was, he'll never sit at my table again. Let's put it like that. But you know, it's the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. So, I mean, it, everything takes bravery. Everything takes confidence that you're doing the right thing. And you got to keep a smile on your face. Oh, I know what I have to tell you. I was in Detroit with Richie Cole, this alto saxophone player, and Eddie Jefferson, who did scat, which is way beyond rap, way better. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And I met this guy in the green room in this little club in Detroit. It was such an old club that when you went outside, you know, the big thing there, which is what's pictures. There was a picture of Paul Desmond and Jerry Mulligan and the sides were rolled up. That's how old that that little club was. And I went in the back to the green room and there was this little guy there looked like he was 105. I swear. And he was black and he had a little jazz hat on. He had rings on all his fingers and his hands were on his knees. I can't tell you the first part of the story. That's just, I can't do that. But later on, he said, you know, baby, you got to remember one thing. Life is flowing and glowing. That's all it is. And I remember thinking, blow it. And I said to him, flowing and glowing. He said, that's right. That's all it is. Don't forget it. You too nervous. He said, I was dying to go home. I was in in, in Detroit. I'd had enough. And it was really sad in Detroit in those days. I mean, windows were blacked out. 
Then we're online waiting for food, you know? So I just, what was my point here? <laughs> well, I think your point was I that you're, too much. I think you're very happy in New York. I mean, you really seem to have come alive. You, yeah. left, you left him in California, but you also left a lot of other people and a, a whole lifestyle there. Yeah. Well, I know you're going to cut this out, but somebody sent me a sign and it goes, in California, we say, I'll give you a call. In New York, we say, fuck you. <laughs> so you can't Isn't take the that great? I know you're going to cut this out. I'm not cutting it out. That, what? I, I'm not cutting it out. I think it's great. But I think that, you know what, you never really left Brooklyn. It's still in you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I was two when they left Brooklyn. So I must have grabbed some to grab some heavy stuff. My mother was terrific. And, you know, she was a great friend. So, Brenda, when you moved back to New York, who were the friends that you were most anxious to see? Jessica Walter, Serena Stewart. Glenda Jackson was here in a play, Three Women. Edward Albee's play, do you remember? She yes. was so brilliant in that. God. So you and had just, a whole so circle of A lot of, of my friends. friends, my really, really close friends, Anne Roth, yeah, oh, Anne Roth. You know, there were just some of my really, really stalwart friends were here. And I hadn't seen them on, let's say, a weekly basis or even two weeks past, you know? And so it was like it reignited my love for friendship, my devotion to friendship. It means everything, even in a marriage. In the end, if you stay there 20 years, you know what you got? A best friend. Absolutely. Well, I don't I've... know what I could say, husband, but, uh, you know, because somehow the title changes and your adjustments have to change to best friend. Things change. So tell me about Lee Grant. Well, Airport 77, Lee and I, and I've known her for years. Oh, my God, she's like my sister. And so <laughs> we were on the plane. The plane is supposed to be down Airport 77, that is. It hits the ground in the water, and we're all in terrible danger. And she's supposed to go over to the door and try to open the plane door because she's panicked. And I am the stewardess, the main stewardess, and I have to stop her. And so the two of us arguing in front of that door and me saying, stop, we started getting into family dialogue. They had to stop three or four times and go, could we do that without the dialogue, please? Because it was like us being so organic and real. Finally, I said, Lee, shut up and do the scene in the middle of us being shot. And so all of a sudden the director went, what's going on here? I mean, who are you two? It was like flabbergasted that we were ruining the scene because we knew each other so well. But anyway, it was a great moment with Lee and myself. And I, she sent me a picture once of her like trying to open the door and me trying to stop her, you know. But you got to work with your friends in those days. Now, I don't know the names of anybody. I'll say, what's his name? But you they know all I mean? know you. They know who you are. I guess, but it's, it's, I miss, I miss what I, what I experienced. I miss those people. I miss Kim Stanley. I miss watching Geraldine Page. I miss, you know, George C. Scott. I miss all those people that I walked down the aisle once in Three Sisters and George was in it playing Versheenan. Yeah. And as I walked down, he said, I like that dress. And I, I went like that and I knew it was, I saw George and I went, God, you know, I was like, I idolized him. He was such a great actor, wasn't he? My God. So there were moments that I don't have anymore, you know, because I don't know these people. Did you see the Tonys? I watched the Tonys. It was a very unusual year on Broadway. Very. How about a musical with 40 people in it? I mean, have you ever seen a stage so crowded? With people in every single, I don't know. I was like, how could you? I don't know. It was like the strangest show I've ever seen. I don't know what I thought. Would you ever want to do a play again? Is it just too much? I would love to do a play again. I would love it. 
But you'd have to do the same thing every day. Did you say appropriate? Yes, but you don't like doing the same thing every day. No, I wouldn't want to do it for a year. No, that's true. That's true. I don't think about that because the work is something that just comes. But after six months, you go, am I doing this again tonight? And it's a different work process. It's something you have to really devote yourself to and explain to yourself the kind of discipline it takes. It's a different discipline. Every night, you've got to be exquisite. You know, every moment has to be right. And if you find a new moment, God willing, you do it right. You know what I mean? It's a different work process. I think you did it enough. You proved whatever you had to prove. I think if your mother were here, she'd say, Brenda, relax. Enjoy your life. Yes. I oh, God, she was so cute. She was something else. You made and the cover had, of Life magazine. You don't need to do anything more. I wasn't that amazing. I didn't know it was going to happen. And I called the guy who was the photographer, and he was as shocked as I was. I, he said, isn't it wonderful? And I said, it is? Yes. I mean, yes, it is. You didn't know? He said, no. They didn't ask you to lighten it, to do something. He said, no. But you've had so uh, many moments. I mean, look look when you got that Oscar nomination. Wasn't that a, right. a moment in your life where you thought, I can't believe this is happening? That's right. That's right. That's exactly how I felt. And then to stand up and go up there, oh, my God, it was really something. It was yeah, something. You really arrived. Yeah. yeah and yet when really I important. asked you, when I asked you, was there a moment when you knew you could really make a living you said there wasn't, but I would have thought getting an Oscar nomination would be... Well, yeah, but, but you know, actors, and maybe you have discovered this, along the way, you think, am I going to work again when something closes or something's over? The first thing in your mind is like, is this it? Am I going to work again? God willing, I get another job. Because it's over. The journey's over. The love affair's over. You know, so your first thing is like, I want to work again. I want to do something really good. I've learned from this. So now I'm going to take it over there. Is And you call your agent. You say, is anything popped up? You know, not yet. And I go, oh, okay. You know, because you want to go on. But what was the longest you were ever out of work all these years? It couldn't have been very long. I don't remember. I know there was times where frantic. You know, like four months passed and there was nothing. And I'd go, oh, my God, I want to work. I want to do something. And then something would pop up. Yeah, I you think know, you're but, never going to retire, Brenda Vaccaro. You're going to keep going forever. Let's say I hope so. Let's say I hope so. I hope there's forever. Well, you've been immortalized on the screen. You'll always be there forever for sure. Yeah. Well, you know what? I feel like I made a really good friend today, Brenda. Thank you oh, so Susan. much. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. Having me. I know you don't give a lot of interviews. I'm enormously, immensely grateful that you took the time to speak with me today. Thank you for all those wonderful performances, even though you don't remember some of them. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> and thank you for appearing on our show, Brenda. I was happy to be here and I'm so glad I got to meet you. You're so gracious and loving and adorable. You just love what you do. See, I understand that because I love what I do and you love what you do. It's great. You're wonderful at it. Well, it was great. And I was delighted to do it. And I've had such a good time. Our guest has been the legendary Brenda Ficaro. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my managers, Rick Marcelli and Robin Bragg Marcelli at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.